Welcome, and welcome everyone to the building the next generation of marketplaces. My name is Noelle. I've recently joined a company called Smart Media Labs as marketing director for EMEA. Uh, uh, Dan Bond uh, here with Cube. Hi everyone, my name is Michael Gord. I'm a serial entrepreneur and investor. I'm the founder of GDA Capital Corporation, which is a group of companies focused across the blockchain capital market. Hello everyone, uh, my name is John S. Lee. Uh, I am head of blockchain ecosystem at Shopify. Hi everybody, my name is Tommy D. I'm a music producer, songwriter, DJ, artist. I'm also a whiskey maker, so if anyone wants to drink afterwards, you can come and see me. Uh, I'm also the uh, founder and CCO of Token Tracks. First topic, and this is one I want to pass to everyone, um, starting with you, Tommy. Why do you think that people engage with NFTs, and what key trends do you see emerging in the marketplace? Traditionally, we think of music as listening. But actually, if you think about music, there's a huge amount of experiences that go around music. You know, there's gigs where you watch the music, there is merchandise where you wear the music, there is uh, meet and greets where you meet the artist. You know, there's a lot that goes on in music that you can, that isn't just about listening. And um, I think one of the things that we've found is that people really genuinely want to get closer to artists. I mean, the most obvious example of this is Adele's concert where you can buy a ticket for like, a hundred bucks, but you, it all goes all the way up to like 700 bucks, which is, you know, where you're right at the front of the stage. I think there's a meet and greet part to it, or you get to sit in the, the sound check. So that concept of being closer to the artist is really essential. It's really important part of our lives. You know, we all, we all think our favorite bands, we all want to be part of their world. We want to get closer to their world. And what we find is that, is that those people that are also what the same they become like our community our gang it's a bit like watching a football team you know and being a being a fan i'm a fan of tottenham Hotspur football club thank you very much and so you know it, it's like when i'm with my tottenham brethren it's like you feel like you're part of a gang that happens really cru crucially through music and i think it's really ironic because when i first got into nfts i couldn't really get my head around where the benefit of owning an nft was until, of course, the penny dropped, that this was a unique thing. This was something that I could own or anybody else could own, that I could have status. And status is a crucial world in all of this. It's a crucial word because we all want status. As human beings, we crave status. We crave the reason to, to, be, to be not elevated, not in an egotistical way, but to have identity. And that's what status brings. So I think when I sit down with people and talk to them about NFTs, it's about, look, it's just traditional stuff. It's status, it's community, it's fan club. We call them fan clubs in music. Everyone calls them community here, which I find funny. And then you call utility. It's like, you, it's like well, that's an experience. So I think, you know, we need to get the wording a bit better. But that's, that's the crucial thing is we're building on top of what is very natural human desire and needs and excitement, really. From a user perspective, NFTs can cash flow. You can actually earn income from your ownership of NFTs. So from a user perspective, why buy NFTs? You can earn income. Uh, also, you can prove you're part of a, part of a community, but um, you know, from a capitalist perspective, you, you actually generate revenue. From a brand perspective, whether you're a company like Shopify, whether you're a musician, whether you're an airline, um, car company, it really doesn't matter. NFTs are the new CRM. It's a new way to engage with your audience, to be able to tier your community based on how engaged your audience is. And for your most engaged users, or the most engaged people in your audience, you want to provide them with as much value as possible for being part of your, you know, your inner circle of, of your brand or of your art. Um, so yeah, just the, the future of uh, relationship management for, for businesses and individuals. So, and I think an important point of that is those audiences become portable through NFTs because underlying everything is there, there is a blockchain piece that every single platform that wants to engage now has to actually index and understand the blockchain piece, which means that whoever has created a community, the brand that creates those communities can actually own that relationship rather than having an intermediary as a platform that owns that relationship. And I think that's a really, really powerful concept because that allows for those content creators or the brands that are engaging to then 
think about what does portability mean and how do they want to engage with their audience, which previously was a very difficult thing. Like they had to pick a platform to which they engage with their communities. And that's been the case for the last 10, 15 years. Now, it doesn't matter what platform you pick because your audience is now portable. You are no longer locked into a single platform that forces you to, to um, only do the features and functions that that platform offers. And I think like, that's a really interesting piece because right now the way that things are done is that you have an audience in each of those platforms. And that goes away when you actually um, have an underlying NFT that's on a Web3 distributed uh, platform. We've got uh, a large artist. They're going to do a big show in November. They're appearing at Lollapalooza. If you're at Lollapalooza, you get early access to those tickets. And then they're going to have five challenges between then and the event, right? So we call it dopamine for the downtime. So you get your ticket your tickets in five months time, you pretty much drift out of the consciousness, right? And if I take this from the brand point of view, from the marketing officer type of uh, focus, they want the eyeballs on their brand, they want people thinking about their brand. So we gamify that kind of that period, right? So dopamine for the downtime, if you tweet about the band, if you do a YouTube channel about uh, one of their older albums, if you do this brand doesn't do a lot their fans with TikTok, but you know if you TikTok about that we, we've got a patented platform then we'll we'll look at that and reward that either via nfts or via coins that'll allow you to earn towards those nfts not particularly because you're going to sell them but just to get further utility and then by the time november comes there'll kind of be different categories and league tables those who have done the most those fans who have earned the most and and put in the most can be upgraded to front row tickets, meet and greet with bands, all the things we've been talking about before, but as a kind of direct experience on the run up to that event, rather than buy a ticket now, forget about it for four and a half months, remember to go that. Some of those things, one of their games is a pledge to low carbon journey to the event, right? So, uh, and, and what our platform does, Small Pitch now, is you know help manage all of the measuring of those triggers and then the relay of those rewards. But yeah, it's a, it's a brand new platform. Even the ideas on this, table right we'll probably look back in five years time and go what were we missing there right but yeah so ideas welcome it's a perfect segue into my next point in five years time where do you think that we will be with the nft shopping experience so, so i started a company called metaverse group we own a bunch of lands including the largest estate in the fashion street district of decentraland um so the land is represented as an nft and we have tenants like dolce and gabbana uh, forever 21 etro uh, et cetera, we have like 10 plus, uh, 10 plus fashion tenants that pay us a monthly fee to have their, uh, to have their store on our land. So the, how to value that NFT, or is just, a, I think it's a good example is how many tenants, what are the cash flows, what potential commerce is there gonna be on this land, and how valuable is the ownership of that land that you know earns the income? And then with regards to the, to the shopping experience, uh, I think those are, are, are great points that, that John brought up, but um, uh, that's talking about uh, the coupons. I, I, I think that it's, there's NFTs bring up, like the, the idea of, of, of fidgetal, of, of mirroring the physical and the digital universe. So I can buy a, uh, a, a pair of, like we've sold an Hermes bag in Decentraland's that you get your Hermes bag, and then you also get a physical Hermes bag. Um, or if you buy Nike shoes, so anyways, for, for, for brands to be able to mirror their physical items with digi digital items, and as, our, as already our digital identities are be becoming um, in definitely increasingly valuable, and I would say almost starting to uh, be par with our physical identities. Uh, and as the, as the digital universe continues to scale, humans are going to want to um, identify you know, uniquely in these digital worlds by having the new Hermes bag or by wearing the new Nike's kicks. Um, so it brings even further um, way for brands and, and users to uh, engage and users to identify themselves. You no longer need coupons. You no longer need to have a separate representation of what it is that you get. You no longer need to actually go and say, I am here, I got this, so I'm gonna get this. What it is, is that when you connect your wallet, 
the composition of your wallet and the rule set that the gates that we're calling them has been set by the merchant can now resolve into saying, because you have these NFTs and because you in bought this, them- In a smart contract kind of in, thing. Yeah. It can be in a smart contract or others, but because you, you are this kind of merchant we want, this is the benefit you get, whether it's a coupon or yep. whether it's like just access, just the ability to purchase. So uh, Michael brought up the, the concept of Hermes. Hermes has very defined rules of who's allowed to buy a bag or not, right? And they have very specific rules around, and, and they do this now in, in a manual process that they control. Nobody really knows what the rules are, but everybody knows they have rules. The reality though is that what this allows you to do is if you go and purchase and spend a, a, a X amount of money and you do get either a certificate of authenticity or a proof of purchase, that becomes your history. And that is something that you as a buyer owns rather than the company owning something about you. And if other companies want to actually provide benefit because that is the audience they want to interact with, it gives you that value and the ability to do so. And I think like the, that decentralized approach to how these things are done is really what Web3 and NFT can power. I think we're going to be that far, far down the line with this conversation about where tech is. If you look at tech adoption from, say, the internet, streaming, and my world of music, you see that there are points where it stumbles along the way. It sort of, it gets it kind of wrong and it gets it kind of right. And then there's a point. And that generally is a marrying point of the technology becoming more user friendly and the, the lessons learned by the industries and by the individuals. We've always got to remember that we want growth. That's what we want. We, we want to build and build and build and get bigger and bigger and bigger. What those people out in the street want is they don't know yet. So you've got to hold their hands in a very gentle and, and uh, uh, understanding way. I think tech companies often run roughshod off the general public and expect them to think and behave the way they do. Uh, and, and, and it's just not the case. Blockchain succeeds when we stop talking about blockchain. Yep. When the audience isn't told or sold, this is great because it's blockchain. This is an NFT and these are the benefits it has over other digital memberships. And, I think at the end of the day, to Tommy's point, is that the general audience out there does not care what underlying technology it has. Just like everybody here has a cell phone, yet we don't care what technical uh, radio stack it uses. We don't care about what codec it uses to stream media to us. What well, we care about that it works, and we care about that it works in a way that we want. And I think like that's a really, really important point in that it's the same thing with blockchain. Blockchain is just an underlying technology. And we succeed when we stop talking about the underlying technology and we start talking about the consumer use case and why this is beneficial for that consumer. Can you name one of what you think is the greatest challenge that's facing uh, the industry or the market? For example, ESG, interoperability. Go ahead. Sure, okay. So, I mean, to me, it's the bifurcation of the speed of adoption, right? So this technology is ripe for innovation. There are innovators all over it, right? I mean, maybe there's going to be slightly less given the last six to eight weeks. Uh, there is a lot of money flowing into it. And, you know, as I've said on more than one occasion around this, and I'm sure I got this from someone far better than me, like when the internet came through, the internet didn't have the internet. We now have the, like this thing is gonna go much faster. And the technology and the innovation is both unbelievably exciting, especially to me and to the panel and to others, I'm sure, but it's also incredibly scary. And then the other side of that is like, we are basically great apes, right? We are doing the same things. We're not ready for all of this and trying to take 97% of the population on this journey is often forgotten about on panels like this because we're talking to the other three percent and we talk about it and we use words like interoperability and utility and and that's not going to get everyone else that's outside there so the how do we keep that innovation going and all the great stuff that you know we've heard about on this panel as well and bring most of the population along with us i see that as a huge challenge right and, it, and it's a big challenge yeah i think i think part of the biggest challenge we're facing is the uncertainty that exists in this space because i mean in my role, I talk to a lot of like builders in the space and partners, as well as a lot of brands that are trying to enter into, into this space. And the question that always comes up and the, and, the, and the thing that still needs to be resolved is, 
what does it mean and what am I allowed to do? Because everybody has some great ideas on what they want to build. There's some moonshots that everybody wants to do, but there's so much uncertainty, both from a regulatory perspective, interrupt perspective, uh, um, and that uncertainty is driving a lot of people to pause and not to actually do the cool innovations they want to Especially do. Especially in the last couple of months or a few weeks. Last couple of months not have very been- very helpful. Definitely, <laughs> but I think beyond the last couple of months, like this has been fundamental in the space. It's yeah. just, there's so much uncertainty. And when you talk to some of the larger brands, like th this is not their expertise. The larger brand's expertise is not to figure out what does Web3 mean and how do I enter the space. Their expertise is how do I make this thing that I do extremely well. In fashion, it means like how do I navigate consumer goods product. In music, it's like how do I handle some of the DRM and, and IP rights management and, and do that. And that is their expertise. Their expertise is not to figure out what does the future of crypto uh, regulation and, and allowable premises look like. So I think that's the biggest challenge and it's one of education. This is a 10-year plan, as far as I'm concerned, of which I would say we're about two years in. But I'm incredibly bullish on this space. It is the future. I think we've all, on this panel, have totally you know, drank the Kool-Aid. But at the same time, I think there, this is the way it's going. There, there, there is no other technology as exciting as this being developed right now that really will break down barriers for everybody in this room and outside in the, in the world out there. That was... Incredibly interesting, so meaty. I hope you all took notes. I hope you enjoyed that as much as I did. Thank you so much. Thank you to my panel. Can we get a round of applause, please? Yeah.